Hey everybody, you're listening to Sit Down with Stand Ups. I'm Ari Azizian, and my guest today is a very funny comedian. She's had a Comedy Central half hour special. She's been on Conan, Premium Blend, and Vulture.com recently ranked her special. This will make an excellent horcrux at number four of the best 11 stand up specials in 2014. I'm sitting here with the hilarious Jackie Cation. Thank you very much, Ari. How's it going? Thank you. Good. How are you? Not bad. Not bad. That's right. You know what? Uh, when I introduced that Vulture thing, I should say, I'm number four. I always just say I'm part of the top 11, uh, which is, is a weird... Amazing. Yeah, number four. Yeah. I mean, they must be in order of he enjoyed them. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go with that. I enjoy it. I will now be introducing it that way. And it's such a great special. I love thanks. it so much. Oh, thanks, man. My soul is in it. Yeah. Because uh, my... It's, it's a horcrux. It's a horcrux. Yep. And you filmed it in your hometown? I do, oh, my home, my comedy hometown. Minneapolis Acme is my is yeah comedy Acme company. comedy company in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the greatest comedy club in the country. And there are many. We're in a heyday of stand-up comedy, so there's a lot of great clubs right now. But it's still my favorite club. I love and the way you uh, shot it too, because you see so many comedy specials nowadays. There's like you know the hanging swing shots that come in, and like the helicopter shots, and yeah, crazy shots. And I love yours is just so true to the art form. I think it's just like. Yeah, yeah, it was. You get, you feel like you're in a comedy club, which is how I feel. Yeah, that special should be taken. Yeah, I mean, there's two really good things. That's what I, I wanted it to be more that, but I, um, because the other way to do it is if you have a really cool idea, like Greg Proops did his in a in a in a restaurant. Oh, really? And he walked among the tables. (laughs) He literally, he wasn't even. It was theater in the round, but it was a round of sixty seated people having (laughs) drinks and possibly hors d'oeuvres. He's so funny. I love. Oh, he's the. He's genuinely one of my very favorite. He's the smartest man in the room, it turns oh, yeah. out. And uh, he might be the smartest man in the world. That's the name of this <laughs> podcast. And then uh, Bamford, Maria Bamford, my best friend uh, in, in the stand-up comedy, one of my best friends in the world, right? Um, she did hers in her living room to her parents. Wow. Yeah. Which my, uh, I'd like to think that my father would sit there, <laughs> except for he couldn't, he couldn't sit there. He would interrupt. <laughs> And that might be its own joy and treat. That's such a great idea for a special. Yeah, you know, I'm afraid my parents would walk out. No, you know, Maria did a, a solo show probably nine years ago in Australia, and her parents did the DVD commentary. Oh my gosh! That That's my dad brilliant. would do. My father wow. would do that. That would be so great. Yeah. yeah, I love her. She's so funny. She's the best. Um, I heard you talking about growing up in Milwaukee in your special and in some interviews, and you weren't really into comedy at a young age. No, right? no, I'm from a little factory town outside of Milwaukee, and between uh, Milwaukee and Racine, it is called South Milwaukee, and uh, it's a little factory town right on Lake Michigan, and my, I don't know, we, we never did. It was, you know, the 70s, some people are like, well, it was the greatest time of stand-up comedy, Richard Cryer, you know, everybody was coming up, and, and the comedy store and all this stuff, and... My dad, you know, my dad in many ways is a guy that sleeps around and and uh, and his and his uh, dodgy business decisions just because he wants to see what he can get away with in life. That might be his <laughs> mantra because it does feel like it bleeds over into his personal life and into his business life and into just every interaction, even with the lady at the dollar store or the free Goodwill sandwich that he does not need. Does not need, Dad. You don't need that sandwich. Please let those people give that sandwich to someone who needs a sandwich. Anyway. Uh, you gotta get the deal. You gotta get the deal. Exactly. That's it. Him. And for some reason... We never listened to stand up when I was a kid. We would listen to like motivational speakers and, and there was and it was the seventies so there was a recession going on. So I remember distinctly he was like he got a new job working for another guy, which he had always worked sort of for himself, yeah. selling aluminum siding. And then he started his own uh, aluminum siding business. And then the recession hit hardcore and so he started selling mausoleum crips. And I must have been 14 or 15, and he was like, I gotta practice the pitch. Can you sit here and be a pretend customer? A 13 year old listening to Mausoleum? Yes. And all I, the, the most, he would, you know, there was a giant binder, and he would show us pictures, of, show me pictures of different crypts and all these things to yeah. do. And there was a shot of a family standing next to a gravestone. And my dad, the, the most memorable thing about that entire pitch was him saying, now, obviously, we did not snap a photo <laughs> of a mourning family. And he did not say it with any trace of humor. It was clearly in the pitch. And so so I got, I mean, I, I, so I genuinely think that I get my timing from my dad. Yeah. And, um, and I get my love of comedy from my stepmother. 
who loved stand-up comedy. She, when when I was in um, high school and, and college, she used to go see stand-up a lot. Oh, wow. And I never knew. Uh, but she had friends that she'd go out from work where she'd go out drinking and they'd go see stand-up in, in Milwaukee. And so when I started doing stand-up, she was like, oh, do you know Rich, Rich What's-His-Face? And I was like, no, no, I don't know any of these. And she was like, oh, I, I go to stand-up around Milwaukee sometimes. Wow. And I didn't start stand-up in Milwaukee. I started it in Madison, Wisconsin when I was at college. I was uh, second year college. Uh, it, was, it was a godsend in many ways. Uh, not na- not even in many ways, in all ways, because I had already discovered booze, and I knew that I would be drinking myself to death. <laughs> so when I discovered stand-up, I was like, oh, well, I'll have something to do while I'm drinking myself to death. This will be perfect. And uh, and it actually it curbs some of the, st- the drinking because you can't really perform drunk. I mean, right. it is done, yeah. and it can be done, but for me, I, I always... It's very difficult. Yeah, it's a different. It's a different animal, yeah. you know. It's. I, mean, I certainly the couple of times I did perform drunk, I didn't care how I did, so it didn't matter how it went. Yeah. And uh, but in the in the end, it, it it's better if I'm not drinking right. and doing stand up comedy. Please stand by. Drinking and comedy right. was a bypass. Right. It, well, yeah, it really helped because because the thing. I mean, the only thing about stand up is that it de- depends where you start and how, how things go. But it's often incredibly free to yeah. drink, and then you end up drinking all of the booze all of the time. <laughs> but you end up meeting like I mean, I met amazing comics and and just people that are friends to this day that I consider. Even if I never see them, yeah, because we're all working the road all the time. It's uh, like if I run into Matt Fugate, who is a guy that I started out in Minneapolis. Because what I did was I did stand up. The story has been recorded so many times. Here we go again. <laughs> I started. I was uh, 19, and um, it was in Madison, Wisconsin, and the club was owned by Bill Kinnison, Sam Kinnison's brother. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, he would get these. It was supposedly, 19, it was 1984, right? Yeah, because uh, I'm going to be old any minute now. But I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not planning on, on living it. Anyway, so, but if I ever say, you know, I did a, a little bit of weed off and tell you that I did online dating. And there were these guys who would post these things and they'd say, I'm a really young 50. And I was like, please never say that. That's the worst. That means you aren't. That means you're the dumbest 50 is what you are. Please just be a person, <laughs> and then we'll talk. And if you like to read, we might have nice times. Anyway, so the uh, um, so I started in, in 1984. It was supposed to be like the beginning of the boom, you know. Clubs were opening up all over the place. Bill Kinison, to my knowledge, was paying young comics from the comedy store here to come and headline his Madison, Wisconsin room. They probably had 20 minutes. They would do their 45, which is what a headline set is. And uh, he would pay them, I believe it was $250 for the week. Plus air, and then you get to stay in a crummy uh, apartment on State Street in Madison. And and then they got to do, uh, you know, seven shows at 45 minutes. And that's what they got out of it. And then there were six or seven of us who lived in Madison who got to do guest sets every night. So the first eight months I did stand-up comedy, I did stand-up every single night, and I got paid ten dollars a week. Wow! And I don't know who was making any money. I'm pretty sure it might have been Bill Kinnison. Uh, anyway, so if if anyone was, was he a but nice guy? Like Bill, he was nice to me. Yeah. It was uh, I was possibly the youngest nineteen-year-old you've ever met in your life, because all I did. Like, I discovered stand-up comedy, and it was like, it was genuinely like drugs. I do- dove into it and did nothing. I remember I came back from 
from one night doing stand up and one of the and the one of the LA comics was telling a hilarious story about Rodney Dangerfield and Eddie Murphy and Sam Kinison. Yeah. And the story was is that Eddie Murphy was mean to Sam and so Rodney Dangerfield sent some like second rate thugs to to talk to Eddie about being nice to Sam because he was his protege. Oh my god. <laughs> and I tell this story, and I'm like, it's hilarious, isn't it? There's thugs involved. <laughs> and granted, I come from, you know, a lot of stories where there were thugs involved. My dad never really told us those stories when he was a kid. He would hang out with dirtbags, and you knew that there were dirtbags peripherally. But he never, ever, my father never swore, really. He never told any off-color jokes. There wasn't a bodily function or a fart joke from my childhood ever. And, uh, and then to go into stand-up comedy where comics, the first year or four that you do stand-up comedy, and some people never get out of it, all they want to do is shock jock. Yeah. You know, they're just looking for a reaction. Right. And usually it goes away when you figure out what you want to talk about. Yeah. But, uh, uh, so I come back with this story, and my friends from college are like, um, they're like, uh, can you not hang, those people are dirtbags, and uh, what are you doing? How can you hang out with those people? Yeah. And I was like, ooh, because it's comedy, and uh, I'm in now, and it's like crack or heroin or anything. I mean, it was literally, I wanted to drop out of college and just do stand-up. And my sister, a year and a half older than I am, uh, was like, yeah, that's never happening. I don't know what you think is happening, but you're not dropping out of college. Yeah. You're going to finish college, because then you'll have it to fall back on. And I was like fall back on what, what What? how do I need why do I need to fall back on anything I'm going to do comedy right and, uh, and, and, and comedy is essentially you know the wrestler thank you so much <laughs> silver dollar pancakes yep. nice choice Ari I'm six years old <laughs> exactly nice work I think we also should address that we're at a Mel's Diner we're at a Mel's Diner we should probably here on Sunset Boulevard could I have a salt and pepper absolutely I did what I did an episode of the Dork Forest with uh, thank you um, at uh, at a Hugo's with with Maria, oh, really? and um, I can't remember if we turned the mics off while we ate or if we just did it. Whatever you like. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the crazy thing about stand, you know, so I did. I did graduate. I hated it. What was your degree? Your well, when I was, uh, I believe I was three years in, and uh, the counselor called me into the office and he goes, "You have to pick a, uh, a major." <laughs> And I said, what? What's it look like? Uh, and he goes, well, you have one more credit towards a poli-sci degree than a history degree. And I said, well, then I, my friend, am a poli-sci uh, major. And, uh, and so I got my degree in poli-sci. Uh, I studied mostly Southeast Asian and foreign policy. Okay. Um, I was in international relations. Uh, we used to make fun of those guys because they were very full of themselves because they knew geography. And... Uh, <laughs> But my brother, my one of my older brothers, got his poli sci degree, and it was all domestic. Okay. And so to this day, I ha I don't have enough domestic information <laughs> to argue with him about stand up about poli sci. <laughs> it's completely crazy. So yeah, so it took me five years to graduate, and then I was like, well, now I can do stand up. It's gonna be great. That's so crazy. Like, was it almost like? Did you tell your friends, or was it like a double life? Like you'd go to college in the day, and then. Well, they the all they all were going to college too, and um, you, you know sir. I went to um, college with these people. Thank you. And um, you know Steve Marmel and Hannes Finney, I guess, are the only two that are still doing stand up or still in in entertainment. Hannes is a he lives here in Los Angeles, and he is a uh, kind of a. I think most of his income is commercial acting, and so he's in commercials. And then Marmel is a writer. He writes on different t television programs. God knows. God knows what yeah. he's writing on. My last favorite thing that he was writing on was Fairly Odd Parents. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was like, you write on Fairly Odd Parents? <laughs> and uh, so, but he was, yeah, so we all were going to college, and it was... It was fine. I mean, I'm glad I got the degree, quite honestly, because, you know, most of the thing about getting your college degree is proving to people that you can finish things, right. right? They're just, you know, if you stop doing it, like one of my, I think a couple of my brothers, um, one of them, 
it's like 16 credits from finishing his degree because he decided to take, I think it was Swedish for his language requirement. And you're like, hey, Spanish, French, <laughs> something romantic uh, that you is linked distinctly yeah. to the English language. <laughs> and the same thing happened with my young nephew. Um, who took uh, Russian. Oh my God. And I was like, dude, this is what your dad did. This is what your stepdad did. You literally yeah. are... You trapped yourself. Yeah, exactly. You, you've self-sabotaged. My friend took... He's like, he took Spanish with me in high school and then all of a sudden in college he's like, hey, I'm taking Japanese one now. I'm like, oh, that's great. What's F in Japanese? Because there's no way you're going to pass it. And right. he did it. He, he totally nailed it. But, oh, did he? Yeah. But. Well, that, I mean... Like, why, college is already so difficult. Why would you do it? It's so hard. Well, my brother, Russ, picked all of my classes for me the first oh, nice. semester. Because yep. everybody's the boss of me, it turns out, when I'm 18. <laughs> and uh, he picked fifth semester Latin. Oh, my God. So that I would get retro credits. Not realizing that you have to pass <clears throat> fifth semester. Uh, you not only have to pass, you have to get, like, a C. <laughs> no, no, you have to get a B. That's what I needed, because I got a C. And I did pass. Yeah. But I got a five credit fifth semester Latin C. It didn't count for Jack. I had to take French. I took French. <laughs> so my question was, when you grew up, you said comedy wasn't really that relevant in your house. And yeah. Where, what were you talking about in those early days? What, I mean, what were your like early influences for comedy? Oh, you know. Was it like seeing Sam and all those guys yeah, live Yeah, seeing those guys. Yeah. Yeah, so there were a lot of, you know, it was, it was super observational in the beginning. So I was doing my observational stuff, and then I would tell stories about... And, and, I, and I knew how to tell stories. I mean, yeah. at the table when I was a kid, you, there's six of us kids, and my dad would, would eat dinner with us. It was every night he would... That, that's the one thing he did do. And then he'd go away. Uh, where are you going? I'm going to go to work. Really? It's 9 o'clock at night. Where's that? <laughs> Anyway, who's buying aluminum siding? <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, so... So six children, you got to sort of so, fight for attention at the table. Right, right, right. At the table, you had two minutes. You got to keep it tight. <laughs> and, uh, and if you didn't get his attention, because he'd go around, and he'd be like, tell me a story. What happened today? What happened today? Yep. What happened today? And if it wasn't good, he'd, he'd move right on. You got to open up with a nice where you're from joke. Exactly. It's along. just do something local. <laughs> ask him how he's doing. And uh, yeah, and so it, it taught me... And I, got, and I got to hear a lot of stories, and I got to hear how storytelling was told. So, I, I mean, that's why when I started doing, when I moved, when I moved here, I moved here in 97, I think, to Los Angeles, and it was, it's very much, it was the heyday of, like, the alt, alt scene. It right. was, the alt scene was just breaking up. And I had always been alt. I had never been... There were there were clubs who were like I don't know what to do with you I have no idea and there would you know half of them were like well you're too smart for the room and I was like I you overestimate my intelligence and you underestimate the intelligence of the people around you because it isn't that smart it's just fine everyone's bright enough to get my damn jokes anyway and then the yeah, other I've people heard things like that where I'd hear stories from like Maria Bamford or Patton Oswalt yeah like, you're too smart for the room I'm like what does that even Mean. It just it means that you're judging an entire audience. Yeah. yeah, stop stop bringing in people who steal uh, ironing the iron from the co there's comedy condos, right? So right? You stay in these horrible condos and the one of the last ones I stayed in, the iron was chained to the wall. And I was like, who is stealing a $12 iron? Who are you booking oh that you God. have to chain an iron to the wall? Stop booking that person. And allow me to tell you, you will no longer be booking me, Albuquerque, New Mexico. There's just some 80s comic out there who has like a bunch of irons right. in his house. Right. It's like something out of that uh, Sam Shepard um, <laughs> yeah. play, the one where he steals all the toasters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm like... Whatever. But it, it is, yeah, it is, it, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. So I learned how to tell stories, and so when I started doing stand-up, half of my stuff was observational, and everybody at the time was talking about how you had to come up with a five minutes uh, clean that you could get on Car Johnny Carson, right. you get on Letterman, and then that'd be your life. You'd, you'd, you'd be made, and then they'd give you a sitcom that was later. <laughs> I think it was 91. Yeah. 
And so they were con people were constantly encouraging me to write monologue jokes. And I am constantly, I occasionally will write a one-liner, but it's so rare and it's not my go-to, you know? Right. I am a chatty, chatty magoo, man. I will talk about something. There'll be punchlines peppered throughout it, but it isn't, it is not a straight shot. That's what I wanted to ask you because I love your style and you're so great at like painting a picture when you're telling your stories. Oh, good. And I was just wondering like what your writing process was like because the stories seem so personal and yeah. true. Yeah. Do you sort of um, keep a journal and write all the true things and then go back and put punchlines in them or? That's this... an excellent idea. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh, I have you know in my notebook right. and. Um, what I do is um, I'll think of something, right? And then I'll, you know, recently I've been trying to think of things that are, that I want to talk about, right? I mean, some things are just funny and they will always be funny. And, but, but some things are sort of funny and like more fun to talk about. Like I was, um, I've been working on this thing that, who knows if it'll ever be anything, but it, um, about how, you know, because this is my first real relationship. I'm married to my husband, and I've never had a boyfriend, and, uh, so we're, in, we're doing this, and so recently I'm like, so, I actually felt jealous when he was talking to someone, and I've never felt jealous yeah. before, and I think that jealousy, and I was trying to examine, like, and I was like, well, hey, crazy, I mean, what I usually do is I... I have some sort of weird negative thought. Right. And then I think, well, you can act on that negative thought or you can make fun of yourself and uh, figure out where the comedy is in that. And that is literally how I live my life. <laughs> like, my entire life is comedy-based. Right. And it's very weird. I mean, it's sort of like, like everyone has, a, if you love your job, your whole life is based around, that's how you process almost everything. Right. You know, Andy, my husband, is a uh, game designer, so he processes everything with game mechanics. He's like, jury duty, this game is broken. <laughs> he literally texted me that, and I've been trying to work that into my action, because that's fucking hilarious. <laughs> and, um, and then, like, my dad's a salesman, you know, he hits on women using sales techniques <laughs> because that's how he processes Holding absolutely. focus groups and right. <laughs> he's just like it's everything's a cold call to him everything whether he's whether he's sitting whether it's a waitress <laughs> whether it's a it's a guy a woman a dog I love that bit you do where you're like everything's a cold call and that's 98 percent of guys right it's like hey do you want to sleep with me no right. okay thank you next, next up yeah and uh, yeah it's a numbers game and it was a huge reveal because I was mad at him. I was mad at my dad. I was like, that's gross. <laughs> that's how you do it? And then I thought about it. Not romantic at all. <laughs> no. And he had hit on my, um, he had hit on Maria Bamford at my wedding. <laughs> and like three years into me being married, she told me about it. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And she goes, actually, it was actually very flattering. <laughs> And she said, because he doesn't do, you know, like some men, you will not know this, probably, men will hit on you, and there's there's a bad way to do it, you know, where it's a physically a little aggressive, where they touch you and stuff, where, like, if they shake your hand, there's elbow squeezer guys, who are like, they touch your elbow while they have your hand, and, so you, like, and they just sort of squeeze you, or they'll squeeze your shoulder, and it's weird. I saw a guy... 61 year old man, 22 year old woman. I'm doing a gig. She was the singer in a band. He was another singer from a different group. Yeah. And he was telling a lot of stories and he was being fancy. Well, he goes up and, and it's just the three of us, me and this very young woman. And he had done it to me too, a little bit too, because this is how he interacts with people. He's a rock star, right? So he gets way too close to you. He's standing super close. <laughs> He did the, the weird shoulder squeeze oh, when he met me, yeah. and he's super like eye contact. Right. Too long, too long eye contact. I mean, maybe it's fine, um, but whatever. But Maria said that my dad didn't do anything weird. But the, oh, the 61-year-old guy, the, the young woman was wearing a necklace, and he picked it up off of her chest. Bold like, move. 
bold move. Not okay. And she was just, she kind of flinched a little bit, as you do, when somebody touches your body, yeah. uh, when you're not expecting it. And, um, and then, you know, and then he left the room and I said, that was a lot. And she goes, no kidding, right? I thought that was a lot. And I said, that was a lot. And he said, he's an old guy. I guess it's all right. And I was like, nope, There's never. Sometimes you see those guys like at a club, but they're like too good looking where they can pull it off. Right. Like do something overly confident. You're like, if I did that, I would be in jail right now. Right. And that good looking thing, it, it makes you less attractive, gentlemen, <laughs> because you're, you may be super shiny looking and it's awesome. They live in a bubble where no rules really yeah. apply to them. They right. can sort of you're, do anything. Yeah, you're just like, I'm, I'm going to move along. And you're like, yeah, there's a line where you just made yourself into a douchebag. And I'm so sorry. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but my dad, I guess, does not do that. My, that's where Maria was. She was like, it was great. It was just sort of a vibe you got off of him. He wasn't standing too close. He didn't touch me at all. And <laughs> you don't usually want to hear how your dad hits on people. Um, so she said... You know, you just got a weird vibe. Like, I think you're very attractive. I think you're very... And so when I when I call... And, and the thing is, is, I do think that people deserve a shot in the arm. Right. So when I called my dad the next time, I said, you know, Maria told me you hit on her at our my wedding. And she goes, which one was she? <laughs> and I said, your favorite kind of lady, Dad. 35 and blonde and tiny. And he goes, oh, I remember her. She was funny. She was smart. She didn't have the right father issues. And I was like, well, that's the creepiest thing you could have said out loud, Dad. And he goes, will you get something laminated? And I said, what are the right father issues? I am your daughter, Creep Factor 12. Which but, one? That's right? <laughs> and the funniest joke Maria wrote for about my dad, and that I've done occasionally, yeah. which is, um, uh, and I told my dad this and he left, which means everybody else gets to. I said, uh, wow, Dad, I'm officially too old for you ever to molest. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed, which means because he's not broken, he's just kind of a jackass. He's not a he's not gross in the way of he doesn't whatever. I think we all understand what I'm saying. Yeah. He is not a molester That's or so a funny. rapist. He's just a a guy with very few boundaries and moral center. <laughs> well, when you say there wasn't really a whole lot of comedy in the house and stuff. What was it like, uh, sort of telling your father or your parents? Uh. Like you were doing stand up, and what was it like when you brought them into Insanity. the comedy club? Because Cause I heard you say, like, pretty much other than you, they don't really seek out stand up comedy. Well, all my siblings have said to me at one point or another, you know, I don't really like stand up comedy. And I was like, yeah, you know, I don't really like uh, whatever money laundering industry you're in. So, uh, but I hope you'd be very successful. Yeah. And when I told Nancy, my stepmom, that I was doing stand-up comedy. Remember, she's the one who's into stand-up. She said, you're not the funny one. Russ is the funny one. Let me tell you something a little bit about Russ Cation. Russ Cation is the golden child amongst our, my siblings. And I was like, he doesn't get to be everything. He doesn't get to be the most handsome and the most smart, the most successful, and the and the funny right, one. Yeah. That's insanity. So... They, they came, my parents came and saw, my dad will come and see me every single time I do stand up wow. and then afterwards I will get 45 minute sessions of, no, of notes of timing his main thing is that I should slow down yeah. the crazy thing about my dad is that he's always right it's annoying it's one of the most irritating things about him because 85% the first thing he says he is correct yeah. and then he tops it off with something horrible where you're like why would you say that and like he'll say, you can do whatever you want in life, which is a beautiful thing to say to a child. And then he'll say, as long as they don't catch you. And you're like, dude, you that is actually the not the rule. Front half of everything he says, exactly. It's golden, and then. But he did say, like many years ago, he said, you should give away trinkets with your name on them, so people remember who you are. Yeah. Well, his idea, and he said this. It had to be 1995. He said. You should throw painter's caps. Ah, 95. Big year for painter's caps. Into the audience with your name on it. And I was like, wow, that's never happening, Dad. And, but three years later, I printed up buttons based on a joke, on, uh, an old, old joke I used to do. Um, about a t-shirt I wouldn't print. Yeah. And um, and I was giving them away, and I was like, oh my God, I'm listening to my father's advice. <laughs> and I'm Doing merch. Doing merch, and 
because when I started doing stand-up and well into the 90s it wasn't okay to sell merch mm-hmm. you were you had sold out you weren't an artist Bill Hicks Bill is Hicks rolling ripped, over yeah. in his grave <laughs> weeping softly and right. and we all decided that we'd all like to make a, a halfway decent living and that's where bands make all their yeah. money and Jay Leno does a Dorito commercial on top of it <laughs> right right and so I mean I think it seems fair that we all get to make a couple of bucks yeah. and with my merch, it became. It first became okay to sell CDs, mm-hmm. and then, and then everybody went out of their tiny lizard minds. I mean, there's horrible, horrible right. T-shirts. Every dick joke in the world. <laughs> Jake Johansson sells a T-shirt. Jake Johansson, the man, is a gifted, beautiful artist. <laughs> well crafted jokes, made for television. Yeah. He sells, <coughs> I don't know if he's still selling. I featured for him in, in Minneapolis a couple years ago. And um, it just said, and it was very taste. it was a beautifully tastefully done, it was a dark gray with a green, very, it blended in with the shirt a lot, but all it said was, touch it? <laughs> and you're like, Jesus H. Christ, what is happening, Jake Johansson? And he just looked at me, he said, I got kids, leave me alone. <laughs> and I was like, all right. I don't know what the big deal with merch is. And bands do it. It's not right. a big deal. Well, but I, you know, I sell teach. And I, but the thing is, is remember, I was raised to to sell shit. Right. So, and I was in the t-shirt industry almost my entire life, and so it was incredibly annoying that um, that I would go back into the t-shirt industry right, with yeah. stand-up comedy. It's almost like going back to college. Could you imagine something like I didn't want to do. hundreds of years ago, like Shakespeare, or Oscar Wilde selling T-shirts and buttons? Up to oh, I'm place. sure they had something. I'm sure they had sticks. Hey, that remember said, me? I might be Othello. Big yeah, exactly. <laughs> Buy the Othello stick. And um, it is, yes. But then, so I started, you know, because I, I in college I worked at um, I sold T-shirts for the football games. Okay. And my brother Russ got me that job. Nice. And then. I moved to Minneapolis to do stand-up, and my brother Phil got me a job at a t-shirt poster shop selling t-shirts, and we did events, and we would sell, you know, merch <clears throat> at different hippie-skippy events and stuff, and those were all, like, pro-choice, and um, na- we were co-opting the Native American culture quite blatantly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Heyday of the dream catcher. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm spiritual. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a dream catcher. And so, when I started the first T-shirt, you know, I had the I had the joke about not selling. It was a vagina T-shirt, right? But that it was because it was. I, I have like six. I probably have six jokes about sex. Yeah. And and that we, you know, I don't count that with that with that sexual healing joke as a sex joke. Right. It's clearly a sex joke. Yeah. I should count that joke. Um, but it is crazy because I. I want. I don't. I don't. I don't want to do sex jokes, but I. You know. But it, but it's always a sign that I'm in a really, really good mood when I write one, uh, because it's they're always super silly. Yeah. And I. Stand up comedy has always been relatively serious for me, where I'm just like, well, you got to find where this joke goes, you know, and you don't want to sell out, and you got to make sure that this is something. I'm far too earnest right. sometimes with the stand up comedy. There's people that just kick back and they're like. They're like, well, you know, you got to pretend you don't. I mean, there's a big thing in in all of show business where you have to pretend you don't care. Yeah. You're like, no, I'm just doing this, and it doesn't matter. You know, yeah, that's a stop action movie with Meryl Streep in it. You care. You cared about that fantastic Mr. Fox. Right. And because that was Wes Anderson, yes. right? That that movie sums up. Because I love that movie. Yeah. It was a beautiful, hilarious movie that had that very much laid back. You like it? That's great. If you don't like it, I just put it through it together. It doesn't yeah. matter. And you're like, no. Just three years. No, 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 you didn't throw this together. You and George Clooney and Meryl Streep and a thousand million dollars worth of artists. You care. You yeah. want me to like this. And for me, I do have that. I do want to do well. But I also know distinctly from a very hippy skippy place that you can't 
you have to not care about the results. Yeah. Because you will drive yourself bananas. That's true. Yeah. I. You just got to focus on the creative part. You just got to do. I, what I have to do is my part. Right. Right? I do my part. I've written the jokes. I showed up to see if they'll let me on stage. I showed up to do the show. Those are the three things that I do, yeah. right? I write, I show up to see if anybody cares, and then I do the thing if they do let me up. And then it's um, out of your hands. And then it's out of my hands and I can't make it so. Right. But there's, you know, there's committee meetings constantly going on in everybody's head, I think. If me for sure, where, you know, I've, someone just, another, it hasn't happened that much, but three times in the last 15 years I've lived here, different producers have said to me, most of the time, it's joking. Like, uh, it's happened probably f- four or five other times, but three times earnestly, producers have said, when are you just going to admit that you're gay? <laughs> what does that have to do with the They're producers? like, you could get more work if you were a lesbian. And I was like... No, I gave it a shot in college. It didn't work. I, because I too looked in the mirror and thought, well, that's probably gay. <laughs> and but thank you so much. And I'll take more. Yeah. And um, what an interesting uh, career move. It would the be the weirdest standpoint. career move. Yes. But it reminds me of other like because everyone thinks other things too. They're like, well, if I partied, you know. Uh-huh. I mean, look at that guy. That guy, you know, he works all the time. Yeah. But nobody parties. Like I party. I was just thinking about this today because of the weird thing that was said to me. Um, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I was thinking, yeah, but those the people who party and then they still show up for work. That isn't me. Right. Right. I was not the one. It takes like six hours the next day. <laughs> right. Right. And it was never like. And even even when I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, I don't party like regular people. I don't just have five or six beers and a couple of shots. Well, that's insane, Jackie. That is not how regular people party. Yeah. Uh, that's how crazy people party. Uh, so, and uh, so the uh, um, <laughs> the insanity. I'm stealing your spoon. Um, yeah. So th- there's things like that. There's like if you slept with these people, you would get further along. If you drank with these really? people, really, they would say that. Well, there's the just no. Like that's the a committee meeting in your okay. head. The notion of it is sort of on the wind. Okay. Where got it. where. And maybe it is just me. Maybe I am. I don't think I am. But uh, maybe, but uh, maybe I am the only crazy person who thinks. Well, maybe I would be more well known if I were uh, more of an asshole. You know, like there's guys who are like, well, I want it this way. You know, yeah. I always get my own limo. Do you? <laughs> You're gonna be famous, and uh, by insisting that you always get your. I was I like, we're going Louis to the same thing. place. Right. Yeah. Louis C.K. always says like he's said no so many times. He's like famous for saying no to studio who wants him to do this, this and that yeah. and he just says no I don't want to do it and then they give him the show yeah. I'm like that's awesome Yeah. but like what a hard thing to practice like if oh. I said no the studio would be like oh okay we'll see you never like, yeah. we'll never do anything with you well, <laughs> you gotta be so brave here's a current uh, a current gem that I forget to do on stage all the time because it cracks me up about five six months ago pardon me I uh, I was talking to my dad and I, I was telling him about some gig I didn't want to do and I said yeah so I had to and he said, well, did you, what, what'd you do? And I said, well, I said, I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to do it. Yeah. And he goes, you just said no? And I said, yeah, yeah, that's what you do when you don't want to do a thing, Dad. Right. And he goes, what was the first thing I taught you? And I said, pick up other people's change, <laughs> which made him very angry. <laughs> and he said, no, I never what? And, uh, and I said, okay. That's and what was the stuck. <laughs> yeah, he was like, what? He said, and then he told me, and I vaguely remember him saying this to me from when I was a baby, and then recurring from when I was eight. Yeah. Oh and uh, <laughs> which is never say no without a number. Ah, uh, yeah. And so, and I was like, oh, that does sound vaguely familiar. He's like, so someone asks you to do something, you say, I'd love to do that. I'm gonna need eleven thousand dollars. <laughs> And then they go, why? We don't have 11 or whatever. Just right. as the number, you know, 15 years ago, I would say, I'm going to need $1,500 or, you know, whatever, you yeah. know, you, t- you essentially flip into a hostage situation. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you, and then they go, no, and we don't have that kind of money. And you say, well, thank you very much for your, uh, for thinking of me. Right. Uh, that's great. No worries. And, um, 
And then you haven't turned it down. Yeah. He said, but here's the thing. You got to pick a number that you're willing to do it for because sometimes they're just going to give you that number and then you're going to stop doing the thing. And I was like, like going to Montana to do a women's expo. That was fine in the end, but I didn't want to do it. Right. And what I did was I said I would do it for, I think I, I, think I only said like two or three grand. And in the end, I should have said... Eleven thousand dollars. <laughs> That's got to be the new number. Yeah, the new number 11. is because then, could you imagine? How, I, I would love to have eleven thousand dollars. Yeah, yay, eleven thousand dollars. That would solve several financial issues I have going. And so, but you essentially, I should pick a number. You should pick That's the a number. Reward at the yeah, end. yeah, where you're like. Oh, well, I had to perform for drunk steel worker bosses. Like, I would love to work for the steel workers. Yeah. That's a a fun show. (laughs) All the muckety mucks, because... They're excited. They want to see comedy. One night, and I've never been able to make this... All I do, by the way, is uh, talk about premises that I haven't worked on yet. (laughs) Is uh, Every story ends with... And then here's a premise that I never turned into something. But it's funny, right? There's something here. uh, But it uh, it was how... I uh, I was working on this thing about the economy. I don't do a lot of political material because I don't uh, I don't always have all the information, but I do always have an opinion. And so, uh, but so I was working on this thing about the economy, and I said to the the audience kind of tightened up on me, and right. I said, "Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how many people are rich here? How many? Who's super rich? Where where are my super rich people making?" Four hundred to six hundred thousand dollars a year. Who are those people? Because below that, those people, even those people, think that they're middle class. Someone making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year thinks that they're middle class. Yeah. You aren't, by the way. Things are going well. Yeah. Uh, so, but anyone here making four six hundred thousand? Dead silence. I go. That's right. That's right. Because w- those people don't come to comedy clubs. We are brought to them. Comedians are brought to them on the backs of elephants. Like corporate events. Yeah. yeah, at corporate events, and we're. I mean, and they. There's millions of dollars. Right. And those corporate events, nobody likes doing those corporate events because, think about it, you've been working with this person (laughs) for 40 hours a week. Now you're sitting next to your boss who may or may not be noticing how many glasses of wine you're having. And And which jokes you're laughing at. And which jokes you're (laughs) laughing at. And so you're all tense anyway. And you're like, it's that's a hostage situation. Yeah. Because your bonus checks are coming at the end of this three-hour interminable thing. It's It's just... It's I the heard worst. corporate events and colleges are surprisingly colleges, more difficult. Surprisingly, colleges are lame. Yeah. Because they shouldn't be. Right. You know, they're thought... fine if they're booked. That NACA thing never. Oh yeah. It's never successful for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it successfully makes a great living for friends of mine. And that's when you go. To, it's like a convention, and then you perform. And then oh they sort yeah. Of, they'll give you colleges that you could perform at or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. The, Na- the NACA convention is. Um, it's essentially there's there's they rank you kind of well or? there's six twenty year olds right. at every college who watch hundreds of one minutes of stand up comics and then you pay for yourself to go to the convention. The people who own oh, the convention gosh. make a great deal of money. Yeah, booking. they don't even bring the comics in. No, and they don't put you up or anything. Oh. So you go because the thing is is you can make a decent living. Like right. you can get, you know, I I have friends who get like forty fifty. You, uh, colleges a year and even if it only paid a thousand dollars in college and they don't they pay sometimes considerably better and so, but the minimum I think is a thousand and um, I don't know I never I never did well I did one that I was like because my, my material is so long and so story based there's no the colleges would love me once I get there okay but the NACA people won't love me because I can't you don't get any it's one sense. Minute. Yeah, it's one. Yeah, you can't do anything. Right, nobody has any sense that I am the you fucking golden retriever. All over the stage. Yeah, if I could just, you know, I am the nice. You know, I would be. There's, there's genuinely. This isn't even bragging. I'm hitting the table. Sorry about that. Uh, there, there isn't a room that I don't do at least pretty well. Right. I can perform in any situation. Mostly because I want to. Yeah. And so then I get off stage, and it may not have been great. I mean, there's like there's rooms that are that uh, charmingly are referred to as urban rooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are black people that you're talking <laughs> about, and uh, and they're middle class to you know what's left of middle class. Right. Uh, middle class black people who are out having a good time, and they 
They call like Mo Better Mondays and stuff like that. Right, and they always put like a thousand, and they're intimidating. Yeah. Because. Just because the name, I think <laughs> they well, put like a weird right. name in front. And it's of because it's you know. As I was talking to a friend of mine, a black comic friend of mine, and he was like, "Yeah, that's how I feel all the time with white audiences, Jackie. Really? Welcome to my world, because I want to play bl- bl- white audiences. So I go to rooms that are predominantly white, and then I gotta go. Hey, I'm a black guy performing for white people, and because when you are a white person performing for black people, it's an overwhelming. It's the same urge to go. Yep, I'm white. <laughs> it's all it very is. exciting." <laughs> And they, and the reason you want to do that is because we're all human, it turns out, and it's the exact same experience. So that's why a lot of white comics don't play those black rooms, is because of that intimidation. Mm-hmm. It's easier to just go up and you're like, well, I can talk about my weirdo, you know, uh, healthcare problems or right. whatever. And but there's there's, and sometimes you know, I'm I'm rarely scared to do a show. But they, they can't. They can be intimidating, and and it's and it's fun when it's different. Because right. if it's a different kind of show, like if it's a nooner, and there are you know twenty people doing their homework, and three people that are like, oh, I heard there was comedy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then essentially you're just practicing your jokes right. for those three people. Yeah. And that's fine. I never practice. Look, Maria practices. Bamford. Really? She'll look at the freaking mirror and, uh, and and practice an hour each day oh before gosh. she goes up. And if she doesn't, she feels a little twitchy. That's why people who are like, she's a little flaky, isn't she? And I was like, yeah, flaky like a fox. Like the hardest working comic in the world. And it's there's no... The work ethic behind Maria Bamford, sure, it all looks very, you know... Whatever. No, she's People great. are out of their minds. <laughs> Every time I see her, I'm just like, she totally inspires me because she's so like, I don't. My she's favorite, one of the bravest comics I know. My yeah. favorite joke right now is <laughs> she's doing this thing. She's like, I read about this thing in an article. She pauses and she goes, "We all know how powerful articles are." <laughs> it makes me fucking giggle. <laughs> You're like, yes, because the thing is, is articles are very powerful, <laughs> and yet we have imbued them with a power greater than the power of a damn article. There's because anyone can write an article. There's yeah. no research gone into an article, and yet we take it as as, as gospel. That's completely so insane. You mentioned you read a lot, and you've always read a lot since you were yep. a kid. Do you think that um, that's important for a comedian to like absorb as much information as possible? Even if you're not writing, you're always sort of learning yeah. something. Yeah, I mean, I think whatever you do, you end up writing about that, right? Right. So I just did All Things Comedy as the comedy podcast network that I'm on. Mm-hmm. And that's Bill Burr and Al Madrigal right. and a bunch of other people. But Bill Burr, I just did a live podcast with those guys. Oh, awesome. And Bill... You know, I so said at one point I was talking about books, and Bill, Bill is famous for not wanting to be the smart guy, yeah. right? I mean, he's like, "Well, he I'm says, an idiot." Like, I overheard this in a bar somewhere. Right, I'm a moron. <laughs> and you're like, "No, no, you aren't, Bill." I don't know why you keep saying that, yeah. but there's part of me that wants him to stop saying it. But it turns out I am not inside of his head, and I can't boss him. So uh, the because uh, I think he's genuinely he's very intelligent, yeah, super smart. And he has a fair amount of common sense, which is, of course, but at the end of everything he says, he says, "Ah, I just, you know, read that on and the blow back it off." Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> and you should blow off what I'm saying, which I think is so funny. It is really funny, yeah. but but clearly, you know, he like I was asking if he reads, he's like, "I don't read." What do you mean? It's like clearly he's reading. Yeah. He's reading. If only he's reading sports blogs on the internet, you know, because he's a sports guy, mm. and then. Um, and I said, will you ever listen to books on tape? And as soon as I said the words, I knew the Bill Burr answer to books on tape, which is, I'm an adult man. I'm not going to listen to you read to me. <laughs> and so, but it is, I mean, whatever you do, you know, however you get your, whatever's happening around you, that's what you talk about. Jim Norton consorts with hookers and and the broken. And so that's what he talks about, right? Yeah. So um, talk about what you know is what You talk about what you know and and you can't not talk about what you know. Yeah. You know, you can tell me until you are 107 years old that that is a character. Mm-hmm. The character that you're doing is an asshole. It turns out 
you have an asshole inside of you yeah. that needs to talk about how great that asshole is. <laughs> that is your character. Yeah. And I have an asshole inside of me, but there's no... It's me actually trying to process. <laughs> Stop being an asshole. <laughs> that is, if there's one message I have, it is, how do I stop being an asshole? And if it helps you guys stop being one, well, then we all win. The voices in the head, one of them is an asshole shouting out, and oh. everybody else is like, all right, guys, keep it down, keep it down. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I was talking to, I was, telling, I was telling Andy the other day, I was like, you know, I, I, I go through life and I know the right thing to do. Yeah. Not because I was ever consciously taught the right thing to do. And it wasn't that my parents were bad. It was just they literally, they thought it was obvious. I think all of our parents think that the right thing is obvious. Right. And they're figuring it out like in their 20s and 30s. Yeah. So it's completely crazy that it doesn't make any sense. That it would be... So they don't, I mean, we're all taught how to be, like, how to, how to respect our elders. We're all taught how to work well with others. You know, we're not taught how to apologize, for example. Exactly, yeah. We're taught, like, I remember when I was a kid, I, I knew like, that really there were consequences. Apologize, not just yeah. say I'm sorry. And, yeah, yeah. That there were always consequences to, um, there were always consequences to my actions. And, um, but the consequences... You know, you'd apologize or you'd do whatever. But literally, when I was thinking about it, the actual consequences, I would say something mean. I would do something terrible. Yeah. The consequences were, is I would get hit, I would get yelled at, I would get arrested, I would get, uh, those were the consequences. The next thought in my mind was not, well, don't do that again, or how do I undo the harm I've done. the fear of getting hit or whatever, right? It was, was that worth it? Ah, okay. Yeah. Was that worth it? I know it? that. <laughs> Was it funny enough? Did I get enough enjoyment out of the money I stole yeah. or the the person I hit? Was it enough to do it again? <laughs> Was I punished greatly enough right. that I'll do that again? That's re- that's insane. <laughs> that's genuinely cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Where, like, if I were to, if I say something mean to a person. <laughs> And then they they cry, or they get mad at me and yell at me. The correct thing is, oh, that was a mean thing to say. Right. Don't do that again. And I, so I apologize. Okay, if I'm genuinely sorry, if I've genuinely learned anything from it, don't fucking do it again. Exactly. That's the that's the real lesson that right. I. Did I mention I'm going to be 50? Hi. I'm just still learning shit. I don't know things. I mean, and it's weird that we aren't really taught. That <laughs> don't do that again. Right. If I, yeah, maybe that's the name of my next uh, album. Do- except for that, um, the, album, the album titles keep getting longer. Yeah. Also, if we ended right now, it would be like an end of a Sopranos episode. <laughs> oh, right. And black. And black, yeah. <laughs> Um, you mentioned all things comedy, and yeah. you just released your last album on there for yeah. five dollars. Oh, right! It's a five dollar video download thing. Yeah, which yeah. is awesome. I yep. re- definitely recommend everybody who's listening to get it. It's yeah, and if anyone knows Louis C.K., tell him he might have wanted to set the price point at ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus H. Christ, Louis. Underball and everything. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because I, I mean, I think I've sold three thousand of them, wow. four thousand of them. Well, four times five. Let's say it's four thousand. Yeah. That's twenty thousand. Twenty thousand dollars, except for that. Uh, more than. And you get all of it, right? I do get all of it yeah. uh, because all things comedy, you know, they want it to be comic friendly. That's the greatest ask, yeah, thing well, about how, it. How has that been? Did you find that putting it up on there rather than I was there selling g- CDs was? Well, I, I printed DVDs. Okay. And. Um, and then I'll sell it my and and the DVD has like a, a bonus thing yeah where it's the Thursday night show oh okay and it's a clip from the Thursday night show where I choked <laughs> and I forgot the next joke oh so it's like I don't know how long it is it's yeah. just a minute of me going huh 
<laughs> well, we got a couple of choices here. I can either stand here staring at you, or I can go backstage and look at my notebook. Let's pick a story from that book. <laughs> yeah, and so I took the microphone backstage with me and looked at my notebook. I was like, there it is. There's the joke. Oh, that's awesome. And so that's the bonus track. Yeah. So uh, the bonus, whatever they're called, DVD extra. So that so that's the DVD, and then there's a and that's twenty dollars for a hard copy of it. You can also use it as a coaster, <laughs> if you know how to rip audio from a DVD. It's also an album because the album, the DVD is um, it is Friday second show. The CD is Saturday second show, put out by oh. Stand Up Records. Okay. And I liked the set better on the, the CD on the on the CD, but I didn't film on Saturday. I filmed on Thursday and Friday. Right. And it's good. I mean, I'm, hap- I'm I was happy with it. Um, and you were happy with it. I think it's it. great, yeah. So there you go. <laughs> so I think I just like the wording a little bit on... Because, uh, you know, everybody's a fucking perfectionist. And so what I did, when I got, I got the audio for the five, I didn't watch the video. I mean, literally... I think the only the guy who guy who shot it. It's a four camera HD shoot, ready for HBO. If anyone's listening, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah. To uh, to YouTube, Vimeo, knock yourself out. It's a beautiful HD. And uh, but I was like the only and the and the, the guy who shot it also edited it, and it was be- the really great guy, Black Iris uh, Media, and Ryan, and he did such a wonderful job. And he said. What I did was I listened to the audio and I gave him which jokes and where they would, you know, if and so if there was anything I wanted him to do uh, different. And so I listened to those five shows, five hours of me doing stand up comedy. I don't reckon. <laughs> It'd be, think about listening to yourself for five hours talk. You're like, oh, I don't even like these jokes anymore. And, um, and so I picked, you know, I picked the best the best shows for the for the whatever and um and then i the the editor the, the director guy was like well is there are there shots you definitely want and i was like well no i like the idea of it looking like a comedy show yeah and uh from a couple of different angles but a lot of you know you see my head face on, kind yeah. of thing yeah head on and, and three quarter shots are good um i have body issues so if you could not show my ass a lot that'd be awesome <laughs> But I don't know anybody the who uses anyone from the behind the curtain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, don't use that. One. Yeah, don't use that. If, I don't know anyone. Who, I mean, I'm Kathy Struck. I went to high school with a woman named Kathy Struck. She had the best ass in the world, according to everyone: men, women, children, dogs, teachers, no. teachers. Everyone was like, "You could turn around. That's awesome." And uh, but, but I didn't. Honestly, though, you, the material is brilliant. I mm-hmm. mean, it's the funniest stuff. I thanks, think it's man. Really great, and it's shot so great. I think all comedy specials should be like that. Yeah, like, it would. I thanks. think that should be the standard. Like. It's because it I hate cutaways to the audience and like all these weird choppy things you see in I think what he did, what he told me he did with the, and I haven't, I haven't watched it, uh, <laughs> but I think what he said, what he did with the audience, he said if you do side shots, you get nice audience shots. Right, but now so like, you get when but, they like zoom in on some guys, face just in the back. two, just yeah. some couple just like, having the, the time of yeah. their lives. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever they yeah. do like like a black joke, they go to the one black guy or something. Right, like, what is right. This? <laughs> look, she mentioned the blind. Yeah. Is there a blind guy? Is there a blind yeah. guy? Anyway, find my blind guy. And uh, so, yeah, it was... I actually felt like I was in Acme Comedy Club. Watching really the show. Cool, yeah. yeah, it's neat. It's interesting because I've been trying to sell it. You know, everyone says people need content. Like Hulu and Netflix, they need content. And I was like, I have content. I made it myself. Yeah. And it's, you know, I paid for it myself and it's, and it's done. And it's, um, but they have to... You know, guys like Bill Burr and Maria Bamford, they can, Netflix comes to them, right? But other people, you know, Mike Kaplan and, and uh, I don't know who else, like a million other comics more at my level and at a level, and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful at the level that I'm at. You know, I'm working all the time and quite honestly, getting to do stand-up comedy for a living is a win. <laughs> it's a dream. And yeah. if I didn't get to do stand-up comedy for a living and I still got to do stand-up comedy, Still a win. Totally. Because the point is stand-up comedy. Right. The point is not, you know, I... Uh, comics you get to do say, comedy and hang out with other comics. And talk about comedy. And talk about comedy. That's it's comedy camp. <laughs> That's all I want to do is comedy. New, morning, noon, and night. What are you going to say? Co- comics often talk about... Oh, so they... Yeah, but, but comics... You know, there's... One of the greatest problems is... 
is you can get bitter. You know, you can look at other comics and see what they have. Right. And go, well, I'm as funny as that person. Or don't even go there. I'm funnier because it's not going to do anything. Right. It's going to drive. You're taking up you go crazy. valuable real estate in your brain box <laughs> yeah. thinking about someone you don't enjoy their work. Yeah. Please don't think about that person. It's they they get to do their work and don't watch them. And a lot of times you don't know, like you said, Maria Bamford, who works you know hours, and you may may don't know that. You yeah, know? Right, you don't that know person, how hard somebody's works twice as hard as you. So yeah, there's yeah. a reason. Oh my God, that'll drive you nuts too. Yeah. Where you're like, I'm not working hard enough. I need oh, to be yeah. working hard enough. And you're like, well, calm down. With I mean, it's it's so hard. I mean, we have so much free time in this country, and in most of your 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 Western. There's, there's enough time to be a hobby Buddhist. Right. Yeah. I was talking to Kelly Carlin on the Dork Forest this week, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, we've got a lot of free time. <laughs> and, uh, and she's like, yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And uh, you got enough free time to be sitting around thinking about your boohoo first world problems. Right. Please think about how grateful you should be. Yeah. So I'm very grateful for that. But I also know that I am of some value, right? I mean, because if there's one thing Los Angeles does teach you is that everyone's a flower and should be valued for your flowerness, for your petals. Right. And so, like somebody offered me a, a contract where all it was was they would have the rights to my special, the Horcrux special, yeah. for 10 years. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, they could cut it up into any amount of airline clips yeah. and Verizon clips and sell it to everyone and their grandmother. I just wanted to sell it to Hulu or Netflix, right? right? But they're like, it would also go to Hulu or whatever. And, uh, and we would have it for 10 years and you would get no money. What? You would get back end of numbers that we like would royalties? we would curate. Wow. And I was like... Well, that sounds like a horrible idea. Yeah, sounds like a cheap Why did I? Yeah, why did I pay for this thing to get shot if you're not even gonna buy it for what I paid for it? And uh, and ten years. Yeah, that's. How about and you'll so? Have ten more specials by then. Exactly, and so my manager was like, "It's just the first offer," and I said, "Well, here's my counter offer. They can have it for three years, but I'm gonna need a hundred grand in unmarked bills." Cash. Now that we've both said our dreams, uh, <laughs> let's have a real conversation. Guess what? There's been no real conversation. So essentially, this production company was like, yeah, maybe she'll sign it. Wow. So, comics, know in your heart that you should get something for your work. Yeah. And when you start out, it's just beer and pizza. And then when you when you keep going, it's chicken wings, beer, and a hundred bucks. And uh, and there's a certain point where you have to ask for what you want. Yeah. And you have to value what you do. And and it's and it's it's not fair. It so isn't, you know, especially if you st can still do stand-up somewhere else, totally, right? Yeah. Because I wasn't also also part of that contract. I wouldn't be able to sell my DVDs, my own wow, DVDs yeah. at the shows, and on my That's website. Insane. And I was like, who are you? Who raised you? <laughs> what? And then you, I hear about people who sign those deals, wow. and you're like, okay. That's are you crazy. dumb, right. or are you just you don't value yourself because you gotta? And we all don't value ourselves. So I mean, I I, I don't I don't want to say that people are dumb. Other people would say that people are dumb. But uh, I personally can't wait until I start getting paid with pizza because I'm getting nothing right now. That so far, nothing. That sounds like a dream for me. Exactly. Right. Right. You're just like, where's where's my pizza? Where's my pizza? <laughs> I went. Oh, I went to. Uh, I did a storytelling gig the other night, and it was. Um, and I left right before dinner. Oh. And so Andy's making dinner, and I was like, oh, you're going you're gonna to have dinner? And he's like, yeah, you're not going to, you have a thing, and then you're going to do your show. And I was like, he said, you're going to have to eat out or wait until 1030 at night. Right. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay. And uh, so I get there, and there's free pizza. <laughs> and it isn't the healthiest thing. Because, yeah. you know, I live here, so I'm like, is there a chop salad without any <laughs> dressing that I could have? Anyway. Or the organic eggs that Mel Steiner apparently. Right, the organic <laughs> eggs. You got to pay an extra buck. You yeah. would think they would just be part of the ambiance. Not all eggs are organic. <laughs> That's true too. Apparently. That is also true too. How is that inorganic? Exactly. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thanks Jackie. for having me on. I really Ari. appreciate it. Yeah, thank super you so fun. much. I had a great time.